um, a project called The Book of Me by Me. And uh, we're getting a prompt a week. I think there's supposed to be in total 24 prompts. And it just so happened that prompt 11 came up at the same time that Veterans Day did. And of course, the lady who started this is in England, so Remembrance Day in her case. And um, so that's why she came up with the military theme. And that played into, you know, my idea suddenly. I thought, well, you, I talked to you. Because, you know, the, I could go talk to Freddie. I'm in the dark about what started your interest in, in the military. I don't know if you remember, but my father used to tell the funniest stories about his time when he was in the, in the Army. And I thought they were fascinating. And I was also born at Fort Benning, so that also piqued my interest. Oh. And, uh, yeah. It seems like a good idea. I've never heard him tell stories. Maybe I need to prompt him too and <laughs> prod him. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Good luck with that. Yeah. So, what made you choose the army over the other okay. branches? There was no choice there. Yeah. If he had been in the army. If I had chosen something else. I would have been, you know, deep trouble there. Yeah. Deep. And besides, who, who wants to be a Marine, they're just two, two, and the Air Force is full of most of evil soldiers, and, uh, and I don't like to be out on the ocean that much, so yeah, they do that. Did you just decide to go the route of ROTC? Was it strictly financial, or that you wanted to combine your military experience with college? Uh... The easiest way to get into the military and be an officer is to go to ROTC. And I did not want to be an enlisted person because who wants to be an enlisted? It's better to be semi in charge, even if you're a second lieutenant, than to be not in charge of anything and be a private. And the pay is better. Very true. Very true. Okay. Now, hmm. part of how that works is. The first two years, the freshman and sophomore year in college, you can take the RFD classes and it just counts as, um, you know, hours of your college graduation. Um, at the beginning of the year, junior year, they expect you to make a decision. You can keep taking the classes and then graduate from college, you just go on your merry way. But if at the beginning of your junior year, you sign a contract, then that obligates you to serve four years on active duty after you graduate as a lieutenant, starting as a lieutenant, and then from there on. If you sign a contract, you also get $100 a month for a stipend from the military for the rest of your college career as you graduate, and then you get commission and then you're on your way. Terrific. I didn't know that. See, I'm learning a lot. Well, was your field of study and school determined by your interest in the military? Nope. Not, not a bit. Just something to get a, a bachelor's degree, huh? Well, I had an interest in uh, counseling psychology, and I, I worked as a volunteer at uh, places within uh, Bowling Green, Ohio. Yeah. I had, like, uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the word... Okay. The emergency assistance type center. Yeah, yeah, crisis but center. A crisis center where people could call in and people also came in if they were, you know, bad way. So I, I did do volunteer hours there. But the military in its infinite wisdom looked at my degree in psychology and they should have assigned me to what they called the medical services school where I could have put that degree to some work. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they, they no, we don't need to do that. So they assigned me to something else completely that I knew nothing about. Keep learning, Kurt. <laughs> well, you got to keep learning. Always. Okay. Um, so I guess question five is kind of 
there was no choice you were going to be on active duty once you signed that contract. Yeah. Once you sign that contract, you know, there are ways to get out of it, but it's not easy. Uh, well, yeah. I, you know, I always heard that you were either in the reserves or on active duty, but I thought the Army decided that, but it's the signing the contract that does it. Well, they can still decide to put you in the reserves if they don't have any place for you or if your grades aren't good enough or for whatever reason they come up with. Sometimes it seems kind of arbitrary. Uh, you, but, well, I remember you going to Germany. You came down to, to Georgia to visit and we were almost bitten by a horse. <laughs> um, but I know that was not necessarily the beginning of your career. What did I miss before that? Okay, on the, the day that I graduated from college, I was also commissioned on, on the active duty as a second lieutenant. Now, when you enlist, it's different. When you're commissioned, you, you raise your right hand and where it's protected to defend the Constitution of the United States, and you owe them four years of your life. So, uh, after that, they send you to what they call an officer basic course. And depending on what branch, what branch they have assigned you to, and branches are like infantry, transportation, signal corps, or in my case, ordnance corps, which had two different sections, I'll get into that later. But they, after you graduate from college, after you've been commissioned, after you're a second lieutenant, they send you to school to teach you how to be an officer, which we thought was kind of baffling at the time because we sort of figured that's what ROTC had been doing with soldiers, teaching us how to be officers. We were not like, correct in that assumption. You know, there were other things that you wanted us to know. Plus, they wanted to teach you the basics of your branch. And then I was now a supervisor of mechanics. I needed to learn to do some stuff. That was mechanical. Was into, did you find adapting to military life difficult? Uh, not so much the work, but the attitude. You have to understand you're taking a bunch of college students who have done what for the previous four years? Pretty much whatever they want to. Uh, you know, they're used to doing pretty much what they want, when they want. Yeah. And, you know, it's very relaxed kind of situation. The military is much more regimented. When they tell you you have to be somewhere at a certain time, you better be there or I got a jury. Uh-huh. And I found that out during my base course when I overslept one morning. And I'm thinking, what's the big deal? It's just class. And yeah, the, the supervisor chewed me out up one side and down the other, and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, oh my god. Fortunately, I managed to not say what I was thinking. Just class. <laughs> because to them, it was a, a big deal. But I never recommend it. I never spoke again. So it, it, yeah, it takes some getting used to what is expected of not so much your job, but how you're supposed to behave and act. Like, you can't socialize with enlisted people. Um, you, you have to learn how to tell people what to do. Which is harder than it's been. Because, you know, in college, they're used to getting along, working together to get along. And in the military, they expect you to be in charge and tell other people what to do. And if that's not something you've ever done before, it takes a little adapting to. So that was probably my biggest problem with adjusting from being a civilian to being back to duty. I mean, you get used to it after a while, and yet I did learn how to boss people around eventually. Yeah. What did you I, do in Germany? I was assigned to a maintenance battalion, which was exactly what I was supposed to be assigned to since I was now a supervisor of mechanics. And I had a platoon full of mechanics and evacuation specialists and people that worked with huge pieces of equipment that, yeah, you would never expect a 23-year-old piece of college graduate to have to deal with. you understand how the, the structure is set up in the military? Uh, yeah. Tell me, because, you know, I'm, at, I'm pretty ignorant. At the bottom, you've got a squad, and that's anywhere from 7 to 12 people. Most of them are, you know, privates. 
had a first class and you and you have a sergeant in charge. And then you've got like depending on the kind of unit, four or five or six squads in a platoon. And the platoon has a lieutenant in charge. <laughs> and she's got a couple of senior NCOs and then junior NCOs and then all of those my first platoon, I got to Germany, wasn't just a bunch of mechanics with senior mechanics in charge. I had a recovery and feedback section in my platoon. And now what that was was when something broke down in Germany, we had to go out and get it and bring it back to where it could be fixed. Uh. Now, things that break down aren't just jeeps and two and a half ton trucks they're tanks <laughs> i've had the biggest trucks you've ever seen in your life because they had to go out and put pull the tank up onto the flatbed part of the truck and bring them back in to be fixed it was called a heavy equipment transport and you have never seen a bigger truck in your life and i had four oh my god and we were responsible not only for, you know, going out and bringing in the broken tanks, but also keeping up the equipment running so that you could go out and bring in the broken tanks, whatever. <laughs> but that was, um, yep, kind of it. Well, and it was also in charge of a, 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 what they call the cannibalization. That was where they put um, all kinds of vehicles everything that they had available in Germany, things that were broken so badly that they could not be fixed, they were put in the cannibalization point, and if you needed repair parts or something that could be fixed, you would go to the cannibalization point, find the part, take it off the dead vehicle, you would be fixed. That's good. I'm going to jump ahead for just a second, because I, I don't really understand that when, after Jess was born, and you decided to become a full-time mama and wife. Uh, it was after Paul was born. Actually, it was before Paul was born. Oh, okay. Because I thought you had gone back to work after Paul was born. Now, before he was born, um, Greg had orders sending him to Italy. Yeah. And I contacted my branch manager and to see if there was a job for me, for my specialty, near where Greg was going to be assigned, and there wasn't. There wasn't anything they could even vaguely construe that I would be qualified to do. So it was either stay in the United States with Paul while Greg spent a year in Italy, or get out of the military and go with Greg. So before Paul was born, I went through all this and realized that, yeah, this, this was not going to work, and I didn't want to stay alone. For the first year of my son's life, so he never thought I'd bring it up. So I applied to uh, resign my position. Uh, and since I had uh, fulfilled my four year commitment, I had time to go on the street. And they said, okay, fine, you're pregnant, we're going to put you in individual ready reserve, and you will no longer be on active duty. Ah. Ah. We were both assigned to the same little, over here we would call it a fort, but in Germany they're called concerns. So it's this little tiny concern. It had three battalions on it. There was an infantry battalion, where Greg was assigned. There was an armor battalion, where they had a bunch of tanks, that's what armor is. And then there was a maintenance battalion, which was me. And I was the only single female officer assigned to that concern when I got home. <laughs> so you would have had possibly a few officers, single officers to pick from. <laughs> For the first couple of months I was there, they nearly drove me crazy. It was like they would just knock on my door to look at me and go, oh, it's a girl who she speaks English. <laughs> Kind of funny, actually. <laughs> oh, well, and I I remember too 
when I called you after I got the birthday card that said you were pregnant, uh, you said that you and, and Greg had started out, you were just friends. Yes. So when you tried to keep all of them, I tried to keep them as friends at arm's length, you know? Yeah. Because you didn't want to like pick, pick one and then have the other one, you know, jealous or whatever. Cause like I said, I was the only single person officer in the general facility for probably a year and a half after I got there. Then we finally got a couple of years. It was during desert storm and he was sent to Iraq. How long was he gone, and, and how concerned were you for his welfare? He was gone for eight months, and it was a very long eight months. Um, at first, I wasn't concerned at all because I knew he was assigned to a, a, a headquarters type unit, so they weren't, it was in the rear, it wasn't in the front near the fighting. And I did not know that he had any involvement in any of that until he came back. Ah. He didn't want me to work. <laughs> yeah. Then did you guys move to Fairbanks, was it? Not immediately. We went to uh, what is called Command and General Staff College. He went to Command and General Staff College. We went with him, and uh, that's where Paul spent first grade. Oh. So we all we drove there together. They, the, the military packed up all of our worldly possessions in Fort McPherson and moved them up to uh, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, which is where CGSC is located. And we spent 11 months there, and when he was finished there, then we got packed up again, and they shipped all of our stuff to Fairbanks, Alaska, and we drove with two small children, a pair of feet, and a hand. You find that, that long move and that... I mean, change of climate, good God. Difficult, you know? You mean Alaska? Yeah. It wasn't so much the climate. I mean, if you've got half a brain, you pay attention to all the, the, the prep that they give you when you first get there. You know, the, you know whether the, the cold is really cold, and they're, they're not kidding. And yes, you can freeze to death in a matter of minutes. <laughs> So, you know, if you're smart, you, you pay attention to that, and you're prepared for that part. The part that got me was the darkness. You just, you don't really understand until you live through a day where the sun is in the sky for exactly two hours and 40 minutes. Oh, my just God. how dark it is for just how long. And that, that took some getting used to. Life, well, you were an Army wife for a lot longer than you were in the Army. What rank, What was your rank when you retired? Okay, didn't retire. You got to stop saying that. Oh, okay. When you quit. <laughs> when I got out, I was a captain. When, when you're first commissioned, you're a second lieutenant. Now, you have to really, really, really screw up in order not to make first lieutenant which usually happens about 20 to 24 months after you come on active duty, somewhere in there, you'll make first lieutenant. After that, the selection process gets a little more selective, I guess you could say, but still about 90% of people who are first lieutenants will be selected to make captain. That, by the way, are what they call the company grade rank, lieutenants and captains. Yeah. Majors, lieutenant colonels, and colonels are what they call field grade ranks. And then above that is generals. Yeah, or something else. Oh, that, that explains then why Greg was uh, promoted to major right before he left for the Middle East, right? Yes. Ah. He was on the selection list, but they give you a number, and they only promote a certain number of people off this per month it's for basically i think it's for accounting purposes but his number hadn't quite come up but since he was going to the middle east he needed to have some authority behind him they did what they call frocking they frocked him they promoted him before his time because <laughs> they knew he was good and he was going to get promoted so he needed to those gold oakley major right? 
So yeah, they they brought them for you. They didn't pay him anyone, but he, at least he looked like him. Passing the guide on. Yeah, that's a that's a uh, assumption of command ceremony. Each unit has what they call a guide on each company level unit and battalion level and brigade level, but for our purposes, we just talk about the company level unit. They have a little flag they call a guide on, and it indicates that, you know, this is our symbol. This is, this is the flag that represents our company. And when a person who's been in command relinquishes command and a new person comes in, we have a little ceremony where we pass the guide on from the old guy to the new guy or girl. Ah, okay. That's what that is. It takes about 90 seconds. <laughs> but it makes it official. But it makes it official. Yeah. And the, the people involved are the outgoing company commander, the incoming company commander, the battalion commander, and the unit first sergeant. The battalion commander takes the guide on from the outgoing company commander, passes it to First sergeant, who's in captivity. What's going on in the Middle East right now it seems to be somewhat different than we've ever experienced before. Um, women are coming within inches of what would be considered combat. Uh, they're not coming within inches. They are. Yes, that's um, that's the thing. Is that this has never happened before in in this country's history so that now they've decided they're going to officially say we're going to have women in combat what do you think about that if they officially said it i haven't heard it it's sort of like you know in, in world war ii there were definite front lines. You know, the, the battle was the battle was here, and the, the rear area was here, and the bad guys were over there. In Afghanistan and Iraq, there are no front lines. You are in the middle of the mess wherever you are. You don't know who's friendly and who's enemy. You don't know if you're in good territory or bad territory, and that is why women are seeing combat. Not because they're assigned to combat units, but because they're driving trucks that are coming under attack. Or they're uh, working in, in uh, remote maintenance facilities that are coming under attack. So if they don't fight back, they're going to just be dead. Sometimes they're getting dead anyway, but the point is there are no front lines. Every area is a combat area, no matter where you are, isn't safe. And that's why they're becoming involved in combat situations, not by intention, but because there isn't any other choice. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised you hadn't heard about this. I think it's by 2015 they said it will be officially uh, that there are women in combat. And I saw something about adaptation of certain equipment that uh, it's being a little bit, they're, they're getting smaller sized ones, less weight, so a woman can carry them. But it's, you know, something you, you might want to look into if you're interested. To... I think this is not a good idea. Purposely put women in combat, you can... No. That's... I, I disapprove of that. Yeah. The military is not like corporate America. If you decide you've had enough of your job in corporate America, you can give them two weeks' notice and walk away. You cannot do that in the military. You can't just decide, I've had enough, and walk away. If you do that, you're AWOL, and they will come get you in jail. There are ways to get out of the military if you want to. They have what they call... You can be chaptered out, and there are 10, 10 or 12 different chapters, 1 through 12, and one of them is for mental illness, one is for family hardship. Um, for women, if 
they become pregnant and want to get out of the military, there, there is a chapter for that. You can, you can still do that if you want to. You know, it used to be as soon as you became pregnant, you were forced out, but now you are given a choice. And another one is for failure to perform. Yeah. There are ways of getting out, but all of those result in a less than honorable discharge, which follows you for the rest of your life. Yeah, I, I wouldn't want that following me. And at corporate America, you really don't want to get fired because that kind of follows you for the rest of your life. Yeah. Yeah.